Hi everyone, I'm Dan Forbes, host of the Lead with Giants community and also host of the Lead with Giants tweet chat, which we just finished here on this Monday evening on Twitter and now coming over to Blab with our special guest tonight from the tweet chat, Sean Murphy. Say hello, Sean, introduce yourself. Hello everyone, it's great to, to see you again. Uh, I'm in uh, California where it's nice and sunny and warm right now still. Uh, let's see, I do, I'm a writer. My first book is coming out on Wednesday, uh, but I'm also a teacher, uh, an ed, uh, a consultant, work on organizational change management, and uh, and a speaker. I'm trying to remember all these things that we're I doing. All those, all those things you're doing. Well, congratulations on the book launch this week, and and hope hope it goes well. So, thank you. Um, so tonight in the Libra Giants tweet chat, I say tonight because I'm I'm in Austin, Texas, and uh, let's see, it's 7:05 p.m. But we, we've got uh, uh, people in the chat from around the world. So, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good night uh, to everyone. <laughs> so we're talking about energizing the workplace. Why is this an important topic to you, Sean? Well, I think you know, we spend a third of our lives working, and I believe that that time should be characterized by something that is positive, something that is a contribution to someone's life. And right now, you know, I don't need to quote all the research, but there's tons of research showing how disengaged people are, how unhappy people are with leadership, uh, and how unhappy they are with their growth opportunities. And that's not a good sign for 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 those of us who spend our a third of our lives working. So I wanted to write something that gives people gives managers a nudge to say, hey, you could do something about this. Um, and and plus, I love I love what I do, and I want others to love what they do. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's key, and and it, and it shows in in your work and in your writing. Is that needle moving any regarding engagement in the workplace, one way or the other, or is it just staying flat? It, it's not exactly flat. I think the last time I looked at the research from Gallup, uh, it's it kind of goes up a little, it comes down a little. So it, it's almost like a, a net zero in terms of its its improvement, which is, and this is going back 10 years, so a decade's worth of research showing that we're not really making things better. And tonight's topic in the tweet chat was not about engagement in the workplace, but it was about uh, energizing the right. workplace. What's the distinction or difference there? Yeah, so, you know, I think engagement is often uh, confused as some kind of HR initiative. Oh, we've got to make our employees fill in the blank, happier, more engaged, satisfied. And energizing workplaces help contribute to that, whatever outcomes that they're trying to get. Um, but I think what's important is, I, I think in some ways we overthink, we're overthinking energizing the workplace. We're overthinking engagement. And if we were to s strip away some of the, the, the consultant speak that tends to focus around these topics, a lot of it boils down to what kind of relationships are we building with the people that we work alongside? And I think that's a simple place to start. And it doesn't have to be some HR sanctioned initiative to say, let's improve our engagement numbers. Yeah, I mean, that it's really benefits everybody uh, to, right. uh, to do that. Uh, so think about the tweet chat uh, that we just finished. Was there uh, a question that was your favorite? I really liked the one that focused on whether or not we should have friends at work. I'm really fascinated by that question. And right. there tends to be two camps, people who believe it's important. And then, you know, I focused on those in the conversation on Twitter that were like, I'm not so sure about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the, so the question was: Is it important to have a best friend at work? Now, was that sort of a, a trick question with the description there of a best friend? <laughs> no, no, no. Actually, um, not to give Gallup all of this pl a free publicity, but one of their engagement questions is around uh, a best friend. And in the research that I was doing for the book, uh, The Optimistic Workplace, I found how key relatedness is in the workplace. And I think relatedness, best friend, they're kind of synonymous in, in, in terms of each other. Uh, and there's a lot of research showing how important it is to us. And it's also just built into the way that our brains are hardwired. So it's not, it's not just a, oh, this is a nice touchy feely thing. It's like, no, it's part of our biology. Right. 
Uh, if anyone wants to take a seat, come on in. If you want to ask Sean yeah. a question or just engage uh, around around the topic, you know, I, I suppose that most of us have had uh, friends at work or uh, people maybe that we thought were friends. So to me, a friend would be someone that I could share something with honestly. I could be candid, and I would expect it to be held confidential. And we probably most of us have experience where you might have thought that was true. <laughs> of the person you were talking to and, and then later heard it going, going around the office. So um, I, I guess it could go, could go either way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it, I think we do tend to have different expectations of people that we consider friends. And I think in the end, a good friend is somebody that you believe you can trust regardless of the context. Hey, Are we're good. Hi. Good Good to see you face to face here on Blab with me for the first time. I Fantastic. Know. <laughs> can you see me good enough? My camera's yeah. probably hard. No, I can see you. See you great and, and hear you great. So, any particular comment or question that you have? Yeah, you know what? On the friend topic, that's a pretty tricky one because, you know, sometimes those whom we consider to be friends, especially in a workplace, if you just so happen to be doing better than that person and like someone else had said, if you get the um, the promotion and they don't get the promotion, it's like you have this awkwardness between you guys and they might, mm. might not come out right out and say, hey, you know what, this is bothering me, but you can kind of tell but by the energy that they're giving off. So having friends in the workplace can be a pretty tricky thing because if that person stops talking to you or start acting weird towards you, you would literally come into work feeling a certain way and you won't want to give your best because of it. And so that can be a pretty tricky thing, having friends in a workplace. So you should definitely use discernment when trying to um, befriend others in the workplace, you know, definitely. So, yeah. I think we might, we might end up with different definitions of a workplace friend and a mm. life friend outside the workplace. Fred over in the sidebar says, Rather have comrades than friends. Comrades will take a bullet for you. So, oh, red yeah, comes so from. It's, I guess the question mil is like, military what's perspective. On the line? Yeah, what's on the line? So, yeah. 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 Okay, what yeah, else? Think, uh, go ahead, Sean. I was just going to say, I, you know, for me, uh, I, I, relation, I'm a very, I'm, I'm strong in the relational field when it comes to uh, just what my personality is made up of. And I think, um, I can develop close relationships with people in a work environment um, and then go home and not necessarily think about them as a friend. Whereas somebody who is a friend, a best friend, I think about often, right? We're interacting with each other. But so it's almost like I have different levels of friendships and work tends to be very, they're passionate and they're uh, strong but they don't necessarily go anywhere beyond the work context. That's interesting. I know someone mentioned before, and I love this analogy, this, this way they describe their friendship zone. They had the outer courts, then the inner courts, and then the <laughs> holies of holies. And I think that was just totally- Holy of holies. <laughs> and it. I said, oh my Purple gosh, friend. I gotta use that. Because you know what? My definition of a friend may be totally different from someone else's. And so, you know, I would say what you're speaking of is more of an acquaintance than a friend. And so, because when I go home, if I call someone my friend, I can talk to that person at any time of the night. And you know what? I'm, I'm very open and I feel safe with that person. And honestly, work friends, you know, I may feel safe in the work environment, but I'm not going to necessarily trust them with um, too much information. And it's not that you want to be paranoid, but you want to create a keep a healthy work environment as well and it can be very very tricky when um when you get to a certain level across certain lines with work friends so yeah 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 I, uh, a question that i thought was interesting too was uh it was question number six out of the 10 questions true or false a workplace can be too energizing and i saw true false true false <laughs> A lot of different uh, ideas with that. What, what, what were you thinking when you came up with that suggested question, Sean? 
So, so when I was writing the book, uh, I had talked with a gentleman by the name of Todd Cashton, who is a professor at George Mason University, uh, who has a book out called The Upside of Your Dark Side. Oh, and I, love his, I love that book. And his belief is that the dark side of our, of our personalities actually help us be, become better people. Not all aspects, right? So he's not talking about murder or anything right. kind of sinister like that, but maybe our doubts or um, our anger. Anger was a big function of his, uh, a big portion of his, um, of his argument. Right. And so it got me thinking, it's like, well, is there such a thing as too much optimism? And when I was studying the different organizations that are in the book, what I found is that yes, that some of these organizations have too much of a focus on keep creating strong relationships that leaders were having a hard time having difficult conversations. So they created what I call the country club effect where everybody's getting along, but results aren't happening the way that they should. And nobody's having the difficult conversations because the relationship has become, you know, this, oh, I don't want to upset the optimism in the workplace. Yeah, uh, Chris uh, in the sidebar says, sometimes friendships at work can feel exclusive or, or clicky uh, to yeah. others. You know, who's yeah. in, yeah. who's out? Uh, yeah, and I think the, the distinction that we need to keep in mind, regardless of the definition of friend or acquaintance or comrade, which I think are all good distinctions, is what's important in the workplace is that there is a sense of relatedness, that when I come, I feel like I belong there. And I work alongside people that I can trust, and I work alongside people that I respect and even like. Um, and when that relatedness is there, it helps to deepen uh, the team's resolve to be able to work together, as opposed to, gosh, I can't stand this person and that person drives me crazy. And that's just gonna chip away at the team's ability to get results. Now back to that question about can it, uh, can a workplace be too energizing? I heard a lot of, saw a lot of tweets of people saying, no, it's, you know, it's impossible to have too much energy in the workplace, and that's certainly a valid uh, argument. Uh, I got the picture of a cha-cha line, you know, people <laughs> dancing and, and cha-cha line. And if we get, uh, you know, I was thinking if we get too out of balance that uh, the workplace becomes, you know, just a party. It's the, part, it's the party atmosphere, the cha-cha line. We might lose, uh, lose the real vision and the mission that we need to keep in front of us to uh, uh, be sure we're doing, we're doing what we set out to do. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So one of my favorite companies um, is Luck Companies. So for people who are listening, you know, Google Luck Companies, and you're going to find that they're an aggregate business. So what they say is they make little rocks out of big rocks, uh, mostly blue collar work. And what they call, what they, you, this whole friendship piece and can there be too much optimism, they have what they call a fierce culture. And the fierce culture basically is, look, we, we want to have a great working relationship with you and we want to help you become a better human being. Their, their mission is to uh, unleash potential in, in human beings and their employees. But the fierce part is sitting down and having that difficult conversation. I love that, mm -hmm. that description of fierce. I think it's a, yeah. good, to, it's a good way to it kind of yeah. encapsulate what we're talking about here. You know, when I worked at Victoria's Secret for a very, very long time in sales, and one of the things that really made clients, especially men, feel very safe is the fact that it was a very, very energized environment. The people were happy. And even if someone did kind of, you know, get too chatty, chatty with coworkers or management, the whole nine yards, it was easy to bring people's focus back to the main thing. And... When people feel welcome, when they feel happy, when they see engagement, it kind of um, puts the salesy stuff like out of pushes that from their uh, their foremind, from the front of their mind, and so it's not coming across as you only trying to sell them something, but that you truly care and you're trying to genuinely engage with them and help them. And so I don't think it can necessarily be too. Um, uh, there's too much optimism or too much energy as long as it's cha channeled, you know, the right way. So, yeah, yeah. Make, yeah makes a point. Sense. Um, let's see. One okay. of the other que questions you're going to take off. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks, uh, Raven. So, Sean. It was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. 
Sean, in your research, what, what companies uh, set good examples uh, today of uh, having an energizing workplace? I saw, yeah, so I saw in the tweet chat, I saw uh, Southwest Airlines. Yep. Um, I saw Luck Companies. I saw Chick fil A. Um, trying to remember some of the others. But anyway, what, what'd you find? So there are uh, uh, the, the seven that I've focused on in the book that I featured in the book. So there's Barry Way Miller, which is uh, you know, from, from a simplistic explanation, a, a massive global uh, manufacturer um, of some pretty amazing tech, uh, machinery. Um, Luck companies, Netflix is known to be a very energizing work environment. Yeah, um, Ali, mm -hmm. yeah Alibaba, uh, which mm -hmm. is uh, a Chinese business, which you know we don't necessarily stereotypically think of Chinese businesses as being energizing, but uh, uh, the founder is really doing a great job in, in creating this energizing, optimistic workplace. Uh, a couple of small businesses, uh, Bamboo HR, which is in Utah, um, they, they, they have what they call an anti-workaholic policy, which basically boils down to if you're working more than 40 hours a week consistently, there's something going on and we need to talk about that. Plus, they want to make sure their employees have time to be with their family and friends. Uh, so that's, that's a big in, input into their energizing work environment. That sounds counterintuitive to a lot of companies, um, thinking. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, the two founders love they're very big outdoorsmen. And so to them, it's important to be able to do those, you know, go out and hike, go out and do some rock climbing. And, you know, when you're a founder, you're working a lot of hours, 60, 80 hours plus. Um, and they just didn't want to get burned out in the work. So they put this in place and they hold they they model what they expect. Um. What about Zappos? Yeah, you know, here's the thing about Zappos. Um, I believe at one point they had a very energizing workplace. I wonder if they do currently because of their whole transition to holacracy and mm -hmm. how uh, upsetting it's been to their culture. Now, it may still be energizing, I don't know, um, but I think they're probably going through a transition where it's probably feeling chaotic. <laughs> and what uh, what about what's going on at Google? Yeah, Google continues to, I think, set the bar. And when I read uh, Laszlo Bach's work rules, I think he really gave some great insight. I mean, he shared some amazing stuff about what Google does. Um, and, you know, their focus is really what helps them be successful is they leverage human behavior and social sciences to be able to make sense of how to create a, a great workplace, and I think mm -hmm. uh, they continue to be the gold standard for a lot of organizations. Are, are they still allowing employees to use some of their time to just work on whatever projects they have of interest, innovating, being creative? Yeah, that twenty percent time. Uh, I know that there was talk that they were going to pull it, and I think they they haven't pulled it. So I don't, you know, I, I don't have the inside track to know why. Mm -hmm. um, Laszlo Bach talks about it in his book um, that it's still key to the, their employees' uh, engagement, uh, fulfillment. I would think so. Okay, yeah. so last last call. If anyone wants to come on, uh, take a seat and ask a question of Sean or share any insight that you have on the topic of energizing the workplace. Uh, from the League of Giants tweet chat tonight. If not, we'll wrap up here in just a moment, but uh, giving people an opportunity. Sean, yeah. always, a, always a pleasure to have you on the tweet chat. I hope you can be back again. Tell us uh, tell us how to find, tell us about your book, the title of it, how to find it. Uh, what do we need to know? So the book is called The Optimistic Workplace, uh, Creating an Energizing Environment for Everyone. And it technically comes out on Wednesday, although Amazon and its mighty muscle is, is shipping the book now. So if you order it, you'll be able to get it in a couple days if you are a Prime member. Um, and uh, if you want, go to the book's website, theoptimisticworkplace.com, and you'll be able to download a free chapter. And uh, there's what's called the Optimism Planner, and the book is written to be able to not just be why it's important to create optimism, but how do you do it? 
And the planner is your week by week guide to be able to think through how you create optimism for your team. So yeah. those are free downloads when you uh, sign up. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah, so we're not just talking about theory, but we're talking about some practical how to's as well. And of course, we see your Twitter handle there. I'm sure we can look at your tweets and uh, yeah. stay, stay fully up to date. Well, thank you for again for uh, being our guest in the Leave a Giants tweet chat and here on Blab as well. Uh, this will get posted to YouTube. Uh, you'll see it, uh, the Leave a Giants channel, and also in the community. I'll send you a tweet so you have a copy of it as well. Uh, but Great. thank you, thank you, Sean, for being our guest. Let me stop the recording.